Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Dan Smith. I'm one of the MS neurologists here at Ohio Health, and we want to thank you for logging in today to join us for our annual MS patient event. Unfortunately, we can't be together in person, but we are so glad that you're able to log in and join us virtually today. Today, uh, I'm excited to introduce uh, a lineup of speakers who are joining us today to provide some updates. Uh, first of all, uh, we'll be hearing from Lauren Esposito. Lauren is a doctor of physical therapy. Many of you have worked with her and know her well. She is also manager of the Neuroscience Wellness Center, and she'll be providing some updates today on the Neuroscience Wellness Center, so we're very excited to hear that. Following Lauren, we'll be hearing from Dr. Jeff Eubank. Jeff is a neurologist and an MS specialist who many of you know as well. Jeff uh, practices um, outpatient neurology here uh, at the Chatham Lane as well as the Riverside MS Clinic and also provides coverage at, the, uh, at Riverside Hospital as well. We'll next be hearing from Dr. Doug Wu. Doug is a neurologist and an MS specialist who is primarily located in Athens. He provides outpatient coverage there and inpatient coverage at Ablenis Hospital as well as Mansfield Hospital. So we're really excited that you can be with us and we'll look forward to hearing from each of our speakers today. As we go through the program, if you have questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, we'll be keeping track of the questions and we'll, at the end of each speaker session, we'll take a few minutes to try to address those questions as we go through. I think right now um, that we've gone through our introductions, what I'd like to do is turn it over to a quick video uh, this is a video uh, that we'd like to share with you, just giving an overview of the comprehensive MS uh, care team. Hi, I'm Dr. Jacqueline Nicholas, and I'm the director of the MS Center here at Ohio Health, and we're so happy to have you with us today. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Douglas Wu and I'm the Ohio Health Multiple Sclerosis Provider here in Athens, Ohio. Hi, I'm Dr. Jacque Nolan. I'm the current MS Fellow here at the MS Clinic at Ohio Health. Hi, I'm Dr. Andy. I'm a provider at the MS Clinic at Riverside and Pickerington. Hi, I'm Dr. Dan Smith. I'm one of the MS Neurologists at Pickerington and Riverside. My name is Jeanette Ripley and I'm one of the nurse practitioners in the Ohio Health MS Clinic. Hi, I'm Laura Poplar and I'm a nurse practitioner. Hi, I'm Colleen O'Connell and I am one of the nurse practitioners at the Ohio Health MS Center. Hi, my name is Diane Massiangelo. I'm one of the nurse practitioners here in the Ohio Health MS Clinic and I am based primarily here at Riverside. Hi, my name is Terry Anderson. I work here at the MS Clinic with Dr. Jacqueline Nicholas. Hi, I'm Sarah and I'm a medical assistant. Hi, I'm Courtney, I'm a licensed practical nurse. Hi, I'm Patty Stevens and I'm a physician office specialist. And we work at the MS Clinic at Ohio Health. Hi, I'm Sarah. Hi, I'm Ashley. And we're the nurses at the Ohio Health MS Clinic. Hi, I'm Casey. Hi, I'm Catania. I'm Andrea, and we're part of the nursing team at the Ohio Health MS Clinic. Hi, I'm Morgan. I'm part of the scheduling team and the MS Infusion Center. I'm Terry West, Practice Manager for the MS Clinic at Riverside Hospital. Hi, my name is Tracy Paxton. I'm the social worker here at the MS Clinic. Hi, I'm Connie. This is Kiosha, and we're part of the Ohio Health MS Team Front Desk. Hi, we're part of Ohio Health Neuro Rehab, working out of the MS Clinic. My name is Alyssa, and I'm one of the physical therapists. My name is Kate, and I'm one of the occupational therapists. So 
So this is definitely a team effort, and I'm very proud to be able to work with such a fantastic team. So with that, I would like to turn the uh, camera over to Lauren Esposito, uh, who will be giving us an update on the Neuroscience Wellness Center. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here today and talk to you guys about some updates for the Neuroscience Wellness Center. So I'm excited to share that we are finally opening our doors on May 19th. If you're familiar with um, kind of the Riverside area, we're right around the corner on the McConnell campus at 785 McConnell Drive. So what I'd like to do today is take you through um, basically a tour of the facility through some images of our recent construction. So when you walk into our facility, we want you to feel like you're essentially walking into our living room. We know that part of um, the benefit of our programs is really the communities that we help build um, and the interactions that we have with our members and that our members have with each other. So right behind our welcome center is our community gathering area for our members to gather before or after class, um, obviously, given the COVID environment, everything is safe social distancing, um, and we will create a safe environment for that. As you walk through our community gathering area, you'll see our studios. So all of our group fitness studios have all the equipment that you would see um, in a typical gym, but also some other special features. So we have things from our free weights, our resistance bands, medicine balls, um, you name it. But in our big studio, our Studio One, we also have an overhead harness system that I'm really excited about. And you can see a little snapshot of that on your screen. So what that allows us to do is for our members who may need a little extra support from a balanced perspective, we can um, utilize some overhead um, pulley systems, put you in a balanced vest or um, a lighter harness type system to help challenge the exercises that we're doing and keep you safe from a balanced perspective. But we can also use this feature for some of our more advanced classes, like our boxing class, to suspend our boxing bags from the ceiling. So some classes that we're offering specific to multiple sclerosis are our MS Wellness Program, which is a 12-week wellness program that we've been offering um, for quite a few years now. So what that program entails is twice a week you're coming in for an hour of exercise. That includes cardiovascular exercise, strength training, balance, and flexibility. And then every week we have a 30-minute lecture on different topics such as nutrition, fatigue management, and community resources. Part of that program also includes assessments of functional mobility before the program so we can help modify any exercises that we may need to. And then at the end of the program to look at what progress has been made over the past 12 weeks. In addition to our structured wellness programs, we offer ongoing drop-in classes for our members. Those are basic and advanced classes. Um, and you'll see the little heart symbol on the screen really depicts the um, intensity level of the class and maybe some of the mobility um, requirements that you would expect to be doing throughout the class, like getting on and off of the floor or staying in a seated position. In addition to our MS specific classes, I'm really excited about what we're gonna offer from a general neuro fitness perspective. So we're gonna offer classes from balance and core, to boxing, to chair fitness, to cardio classes, and then all the way up to your boot camp class. So again, you can see we're trying to make it easy for our members to know the intensity of the class, and then we can help gauge which class would be the most appropriate for you. But we're trying to increase um, our portfolio of offerings so you can get more variety in your fitness program. So our next studio as you make your way through our large studio would be our cardio studio. One of the unique off, um, offerings in this studio is the type of equipment. So we have everything from seated recumbent steppers to spin bikes to ellipticals and treadmills all in one studio. So everybody can exercise together no matter what piece of equipment would be the best fit for them mobility wise. In addition to that, we have barn doors that open this cardio studio into our group fitness classes so we can integrate um, even a larger space to our programming. 
The next studio on our tour would be our Mind and Body Studio, which I think would arguably be um, the most beautiful space in the facility with the floor to ceiling windows and really taking in the beautiful the scenery that surrounds our uh, facility. So in this studio, you would find classes um, from our chair-based yoga program to our advanced yoga program um, to really get some of that mindfulness-based practice into your fitness routine. And in the warmer months, we have the opportunity to take our participants out onto the yoga deck for some outdoor yoga practice, some stretch and refresh, refresh classes, or if the, the deck is not in use for our fitness classes, this is a great place for our members to go um, and just you know, be outside and enjoy the, the warmer temperatures um, and maybe do a meditative type practice. On the right hand side, you'll see some garden boxes there. So again, this is our way of really trying to foster a community where we're going to be creating a community gardening program at the center. We have a track that is three lanes that circles our courtyard. The track is a 17th of a mile and you'll see that we have handrails along the long ends of the track and built in some seating along the way for built-in rest stops should a member need to take a break or a space to sit down before or after class. The next studio that we have is our open gym. So we know that group fitness isn't for everybody and some of our clients really like to do more of an independent workout as well. So we have this open during all of our hours of operation and we have a piece of um, equipment there on the right, which is our TechnoGym kiosk, which integrates with all of our equipment that is our TechnoGym software. And it really can walk you through um, how to set up the equipment and then track your progress along the way. The next stop on our tour is our classroom. So as part of um, what we're trying to do at the center is offer a lot of community education. And that will be free um, to anybody in the community whether or not you're a member of our facility. We also have the ability to stream our education um, classes live. If you have loved ones that maybe want to tune in and learn more about the topic or learn more about your diagnosis um, and they can't make it to the facility. As you'll see on the right is our courtyard. So this is in the center of our building and it was um, made a reality by a generous donation from a, a family in our community. And this is one of the most serene places in the building where you can really sit and again, have some of that um, meditative practice um, or just gather. There are some picnic benches out there with your classmates. So I wanna invite everyone um, who's on our event today to join us on April 28th for a virtual open house event. As part of um, the mailer that will go out, everyone who's signed in today will get a link to join us where we'll talk more about the space and you'll see it live. And if you would like to learn more information about the center, we're gonna drop into the chat the link here on the screen. So you can fill out the form and we can call you personally to talk about our membership offerings. And you can also see on the bottom here, we really wanna know what you're interested in and we can talk to you about membership rates and all of that stuff um, as, as part of our conversation. So we hope to hear from you soon. And thank you so much for letting me take some time today to talk to you about what we're doing here at the center. And I, yep, there we go. Thank you, Lauren, so much for sharing these updates. I know so many people are looking forward to checking out the Wellness Center. <clears throat> All right, at this time, I would like to hand the presentation over to Dr. Jeff Eubank. He's going to be giving us an update on minimizing infection risks with MS medications. Thanks for coming, everybody, today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about minimizing infection risks. Uh, over the last 25 years or so, we've had a number of therapies uh, come to us to help manage uh, MS and the disease itself, 
but with that comes some infection risks. And so we're going to go through some of that uh, today. Hopefully I can share that with you and you can understand what we're thinking about and what conversations you may need to have with your healthcare provider. So factors that increase the likelihood of infections in general or maybe viral infections. Uh, some people already have a uh, pre-existing weakened immune system, so we have to keep that in line. Uh, some people are under the impression that MS itself causes you to be more susceptible to infections because of an altered immune system, but that's probably not uh, terribly uh, relevant here. It's, it's more that if people have an above and beyond immunodeficiency. And the other thing that happens as we get older is that our immune systems can get a little bit weaker uh, and that can lead to more uh, risk for infection. The other factors that can influence the likelihood of infections is that uh, the treatments themselves may lead to a reduced number of lymphocytes, which are uh, a subset of white blood cells that help fight infections, or those uh, cells may actually have reduced function. So what are the strategies we use to try and reduce infection risk? And we're going to go through these in a little bit more detail, but a, a high overview would be we screen for infection risk by screening to see if people have certain infections before we get on therapies. The other thing we can do is we can vaccinate if there's a specific risk uh, when possible. Uh, one of those we'll talk about later is the varicella zoster virus. Um, we obviously have medications that we can use to treat certain infections if it's uh, important or to prevent them. And then we have monitoring that we need to do uh, that we check typically with blood work to look for the things that might increase the risk for someone to get certain types of infections. And lastly, if we understand these things and somebody is having an infection, identifying things early gives us a better chance of addressing them and having success. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is, it's a big area if you're in MS, we know some of our therapies uh, cause something called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is a bit of a mouthful, also known as PML. So this is caused by something called the JC virus. Uh, probably 90% of adults have seen this virus in their lifetime, although if we uh, look at the number who test positive for this, for antibodies to the virus, it's actually closer to about 55%. So it's a really common thing that's out there. Generally speaking, it's not serious. For the vast majority of us, we have it and it's no big deal. However, if your immune system has been weakened or altered, uh, you might be at risk for that, and it can cause a serious, often deadly brain infection known as PML. I put a picture up of somebody that had PML, and you see that large white area in the bottom left corner of that uh, scan shows an area where somebody had that infection. So what are the symptoms of this? One side can go weak or clumsy. It can affect speech or language. It can affect vision. There can be changes in thinking and behavior, and sometimes even new onset seizures. And the tricky part is people say, geez, that sounds a bit like my MS. And so we have to keep that in mind. If people are at risk for this particular infection, uh, we want to, if they have new symptoms, we're trying to parse out whether it could be due to that or MS. The, the timing is a little bit different, and the symptoms are a little bit different, but it's one of the things we have to keep in mind. So one of the drugs that can increase the risk of PML is a drug that uh, many of you have heard of called natalizumab or Tysabri. Um, and so this particular drug, uh, when it first was released, a uh, few months afterwards we realized that it could cause this condition called PML. And so the things that make somebody more likely to develop PML if they're on Tysabri include being previously on another immunosuppressant, say if someone was on a chemotherapy for some use in the past. The other thing is the longer you're on the medication, uh, the higher the risk ends up getting. So when you first go on it in that first year, virtually nobody would get PML. But once you get to about two years, that's when the risk starts to kick in. And then lastly is uh, testing for the JC virus antibody. Um, and the numbers that I've given here are to say, if you test negative for the antibody, your risk is very low to get this infection, it might be as low as one in 10,000. If you're a little bit positive for the antibody, uh, say at a level below one, uh, that risk goes up a little bit to about one in 5,000. 
And if you get up above uh, a level of this antibody greater than 1.5, that risk can go as high as 1 in 300. So you can see just because you have the JC virus and even if you're antibody positive doesn't mean you're suddenly going to get it, but the risk goes up and up. And then we have that as part of our conversation, which drugs may be the most appropriate drugs. And we look for this typically at least every six months and sometimes more often just to make sure that somebody doesn't become positive. And last, we have a mitigation strategy for people that are positive that if we want to stay on the drug, sometimes we can extend the dose between natalizumab injections to try and reduce that risk. There's some other drugs that can cause PML, but it's much less common. But we've seen it in a, a class of drugs called S1P receptor blockers. You may have heard of, heard of Jelenia, Mazent, Zaposia, and then there's a new one called Ponvori, so we think there's a slight risk there. Um, people that are on Tecfidera or Vermerity or what we call the fumarates, if they get low lymphocytes, they can have a small risk of PML as well. And we also believe that some of our other agents that work on a, uh, something called anti-CD20s or B-cells, Ocrevus, and then newer drugs like Casimpta and an older drug called Rituxin, we've had cases of PML explained, but certainly much less than we see with Tysabri. Next, there's certain drugs that we care about uh, when it comes to varicella zoster. So if we're going to put people on certain drugs like what we call S1P receptors, Jelenia and things like that, we're going to want to know if the person had chickenpox before or if they've had the vaccination. And if they haven't, we're going to test a blood test to see if you have appropriate antibodies to help prevent, reduce the risk for having an exposure to the varicella zoster virus. And one point to put up there, the, the reason we're doing that is if somebody hasn't seen the varicella zoster virus and they get exposed to it at that point, that might put them at risk for a much more serious infection than you might have during childhood. Um, and then if we find out that somebody hasn't been exposed uh, to this in the past, then we're more likely to represent or recommend that they get some sort of vaccination before we put them on certain therapies. Hepatitis B and C is also something that we're uh, concerned about with certain medications. Uh, those B cell therapies that I talked about before are the anti-CD20s, which include Ocrevus, Rituxin, and a new medication called Casimpta. We want to check for this to see if somebody has an infection. Now, some people have been exposed in the past, uh, and the infection is dormant, but sometimes people actually have an active infection. So we're going to want to look at that. Um, because we don't want to reactivate that infection. And so there's certain strategies that we can use to keep that from happening if we need to use one of these drugs. Uh, we also look for this, uh, these types of infections uh, with other drugs, including uh, alemtuzumab or Lemtrada, and another one called cladribine or mavenclad. So a few other infections that we're going to think about before we put people on certain medications. Uh, if we're going to put people on uh, Mavenclad, Abaju, or Lemtrada, we're going to screen for TB, and that can be done with one of those uh, TB skin tests or PPD, and we can also do it with blood tests as well. Uh, if somebody's going to go on Lemtrada particularly, uh, women uh, need to be screened for HPV, which can cause uh, a form of cervical cancer, and so we're going to want uh, that to happen before uh, going on a drug like Lemtrada and also yearly. And it's also recommended that be looked for as well when we're going on certain agents called uh, those S1P blocking agents, which include Jelenia and the others that I've mentioned there. Listeria is a, a unique uh, bacterial infection that can occur. Uh, and if patients are on Lemtrada, we need to counsel them to be aware of that after they've received a medication. And it basically means uh, avoiding certain, t certain foods such as unpasteurized dairy products, uh, certain lunch meats, unless it's heated up, and sprouts of all things. And then lastly, we have infections which include respiratory and urinary tract infections can be increased with certain medications like Ocrevus, and we monitor uh, blood tests to try and see if that risk might be increased as well while they're on the medication. And I'll put in a, a brief here, thing here about COVID-19. Uh, things that put people at a higher risk for developing problems with COVID-19, ones that you may have already heard of, are age, level of disability, and certain medical conditions. And then the black and Hispanic populations can be at higher risk for hospitalizations. 
most of our medications don't increase the risk for severe uh, COVID-19. The exception, though, is uh, our anti-CD20 medications like Ocrevus, Rituxin, and likely Casimpta may increase the risk of having more severe COVID-19 infections. And so we have these conversations with our patients to let them know that. And then lastly, vaccinations. Uh, in general, we like to avoid live virus vaccines in our MS patients, especially those that are on medications that suppress the immune system. Uh, we talked about the varicella zoster uh, vaccine as being one that we would do prior to going on certain medications. And we usually recommend the majority of our patients get the influenza vaccine. And then lastly, uh, COVID-19 vaccinations. We feel people with MS in general should be vaccinated against the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, we feel it's safe to use in people with MS, and it's also safe to use with our various medications. And a lot of people are asking, which one should I get? And our current recommendation is the one you can get, because we really typically don't have a choice. And then we're going to want to have some unique timing, depending on which drugs people are on, preferably before they go on a drug that's going to suppress their immune system, or if they're on treatment, at what time we might do that, such as with Ocrevus, we're going to want to try to get the uh, vaccine given within two weeks before they go on their next round of treatment. So I think at this point I'm going to open it up for questions. So let's look to see what we have. So one of the first questions I see up there is what are the early symptoms I should be aware of for PML? Uh, the, you know, the things we tell people about are basically any new neurologic symptom you have we want to know about. And that's not because most of them are due to PML, but they also relate to MS. So the things that I mentioned before would be, what if one side became weaker uh, over a course of several days? What if suddenly the vision was impaired, particularly if one side of, of your vision was impaired? Uh, oftentimes people can kind of lose half of their vision off to one side or the other. Having new language problems that you didn't have, not being able to find the right word, or really a, a, a uh, uh, some sort of behavioral change that others might notice as well. So those would be some of the big ones we tell people to watch for. Next question, does a normal blood test routinely show if there's an infection? So if we're looking for infections, there's a number of different ways we, we try to discern if somebody has an infection. Uh, some of the things we do, we people may not know they have an infection. So with things like hepatitis B and C, uh, we have blood tests for that. Same for HIV. Um, if somebody, if we're seeing if somebody actually has a, an infection that's causing current symptoms, such as if you have a fever, things like that, there's a number of different ways to look for that. If it's a urinary tract infection, we're looking more at the urine. If it's somebody we're worried about having an upper respiratory tract infection or a lung infection, uh, we're likely going to use uh, a chest x-ray to look for that kind of thing. Um, but it really just depends on which infection we're talking about, how we look for that. So. We still have some time, but I just wanted to, if there's any other questions, I'll give it another 30 seconds or so, and if not, I will yield my time back over uh, to Dr. Smith to introduce our next speaker. Well, fantastic. Thanks for you uh, for being here again today. I hope I provided you some uh, useful information and hopefully have a decent conversation with your health care provider next time you come in to see, uh, see them. Thanks so much, Dr. Eubank. <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Doug Wu, and he's going to be giving us uh, an update on vision and multiple sclerosis. Thanks very much, Dr. Smith. And uh, hello, everyone. First of all, I want to wish everybody happy spring. Um, it's nice that it's warm and we get a chance to go outside and I'm looking forward to planting tomatoes and flowers and then unfortunately usually with me usually a week later they're all dead. So, but anyway, it's still nice to get out there. So I thought I'd talk about vision and, and multiple sclerosis. Vision is, a, is the primary way it seems like we interact with a lot with our environment. Um, and, and, uh, and so I thought I'd go over it a little bit. 
um, just so people can understand um, what's going on. So with vision, um, with vision, basically what this is showing you is that um, is that when we see, basically, if there's an image off to the left, the images will go into the eyeball, and the eye is connected through nerves that travel through the brain until it hits the back part of the brain, what we call the occipital lobe. Um, and the occipital lobe helps us interpret what we see. You may have heard a while ago about um, Dr. Sachs. He wrote a book um, entitled The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Um, and, and basically, if in that particular situation, um, there was a lesion or something affecting the occipital lobe so that that uh, person's brain couldn't interpret the images correctly, even though there was nothing obstructing the images at all. Um, and that's what that was about. Um, that typically does not happen with um, people who have MS, but just an ex explanation of what it does. But basically, when we see something, um, this is another view showing that, for example, if there is an image like the sun off to the left, uh, what that image does is that it gets um, reflected onto the side of the eyeballs on the right. And you can see those little suns there um, representing where the image is. And those images then gets transmitted along the pathways that are outlined in red um, along the optic nerves from either eye. And they then cross, one crosses over to join the other one at what we call the optic chiasm. And they get transmitted to this other center called uh, the lateral geniculate nucleus. And then the lateral geniculate nucleus, it transfers that information from each side of the eye uh, to the back part of the brain, called the visual cortex. Um, and there is a late question, and just as a side note, that if there could be a discussion about the COVID vaccine, um, and could I or Dr. Smith talk about it? Certainly, I think Dr. Smith is highly expert um, to uh, talk about this because he has undergone specialized training, not just in MS, but also in neuroinfection and whatnot. He's um, slated to um, give one of the keynote speeches at the upcoming uh, Neuroscience Symposium about this. So I think we can wait for that if you want to wait until his um, presentation afterwards. But absolutely, um, he would be the best to address that. Um, going back to vision. So really with, the, uh, with MS, a lot, of, a lot of, um, of what we do, it focuses around the optic nerve, um, again, which transmits information from one of the eyeballs um, back towards the brain. And so certainly one of the common conditions we see, it's called optic neuritis. Uh, and again, as you can see on the left, with any uh, multiple sclerosis attack, the immune system, it, it, it damages the myelin, um, which surrounds the core of the nerve, which is called the axon. And you can see on the left that when you have damage to the myelin where it's scarred, it disperses the nerve impulse, so it ends up not being as strong uh, when it leaks through. Uh, if you look on the images on the right, you can see that the optic nerve can become inflamed, um, and it damages the myelin of the optic nerve, so that when you're trying to see something, the information is not getting uh, through to the brain as well, and so it can impair your vision just for that one eye. So the symptoms for optic neuritis, as you review, some of you may have experienced this or heard of somebody had, uh, but really it's a triad of three symptoms. Number one, again, because the optic nerve is damaged, you can't see things as well, and so it can be uh, blurry. Um, a lot of times people have told me that it's not that it's a black shade over the eye, but it's more like sort of smoke coming up in front of them and they're trying to see through it. Or, for example, if it was a, a window pane, it would have been smeared with soap and you just can't quite see through the smearing. It's more like that as opposed to an overt black um, shade. If, um, if the optic neuritis is severe enough, it can be overtly black, but a lot of times it's not that way. Another symptom people report is that colors, they're not quite as vibrant. Um, instead of being, for example, a bright red, it can be a muted brown color. And that's what we call um, color desaturation. And then a third symptom that can occur is that uh, because there is inflammation of the nerve behind the eyeball, uh, whenever you look around with your eye, uh, for example, if you're looking off to the side, the movement of the eyeball will pull onto the optic nerve and cause traction. And because the optic nerve is already inflamed, it can cause pain. Typically, it's pain or discomfort that's more so behind the eye. Um, and again, it tends to come on as you, as you look around from side to side, um, and then it improves once the eye's looking straight ahead. Um, but yeah, this is the main triad, as we call it, of symptoms. Um, not everybody has all of these symptoms, but these are the basic things that we can see. 
Now, when you go into the doctor's office, a lot of times we'll try to visualize and see what the optic nerve head looks like. Again, we can't see the entire optic nerve, but we can at least see uh, the part um, that sticks out from the back of the eye. Um, and you can see it there at what the blue arrow is pointing to. Um, and there's two fundoscopes we tend to use. The one on the upper part is what a lot of people have uh, been seen uh, using, and you can see we have to get very close. There's this other one lower down, which actually allows more comfort um, so we don't have to be so close to each other. And actually, the one on the bottom, it magnifies the view. Uh, but either with either one, the idea is to try to look uh, through the cornea uh, within the iris, through that hole, and we can take a look and see what the macula looks like, which is the back part of the eye, but also what the optic nerve head looks like. Um, if you have a cataract, it actually tends to be within the lens in the middle of that hole there, in the middle of the iris. And then when we're looking at somebody's optic nerve head, um, actually if somebody has symptoms of octonitis, like they come in and they say, yeah, yesterday, just yesterday, a day ago, I can't see as well, it hurts behind the eye, and I can't see colors are not as vibrant. If we take a look in the back of the eye, most of the time we'll actually see that it looks normal. Um, and that's because the changes that we can see with octonitis, it can take at least three days um, before it, it, um, it manifests. Usually with the nerve, when we're looking at it, we look to see if it's a very sharp circle with sharp edges and see if the color looks sort of pink, red, um, and whatnot. But if somebody's had optic neuritis and if the symptoms have gone on for more than three days, then what we can see is what you see in the image on the right, where actually um, the optic nerve head is swollen. I don't know if you can appreciate it as well, but you see that the edges of it are sort of muted and flat. They're not quite as sharp as the image on the left-hand side. And sometimes we try to get a sense that these, the blood vessels that we see that come out of the middle optic nerve and, and disperse around it, it you kind of sometimes get a sense that it's being pushed out of the frame towards you, that there's a little herve, curve or a little hump or the arteries and the veins are, have to go over the uh, top of that swollen uh, optic nerve. Um, that's kind of what we're trying to see if that happens. Certainly if somebody has symptoms which are very consistent with optic neuritis and if the optic nerve head looks normal, we'll still probably treat anyway just because of the ongoing symptoms and things. And uh, we'll also try to get an MRI scan uh, of what we call the orbits. The orbit is actually the eye socket um, and it's different from an MRI of the brain in that it focuses much more so onto the orbits and gives us a magnified view. Um, we'll commonly order an MRI scan of the brain with contrast unless somebody is allergic. And if somebody has optic neuritis, um, that part of the optic nerve which is inflamed will light up with um, contrast, which you can see involving um, that optic nerve on the right-hand side of the image um, compared to the other side where it's normal. Now, what happens is that when the optic nerve head becomes inflamed is that the, op the optic nerve itself will swell. It'll swell to the degree that it'll impede the normal flow of fluid uh, up and down the nerve. Um, nerves are living tissue, and so they do have fluid that circulates up and down the nerves to carry metabolites and, and, um, and food and carry away waste products. And that fluid can back up, and this is what causes actually the swelling that we see at the optic nerve head. So optic neuritis was actually one of the seminal uh, syndromes for MS that led to a very important study that we use all the time in multiple sclerosis. It's called the optic the um, it's, it was a randomized controlled trial of steroids and the treatment of optic neuritis. It came out in 1992, um, and this is basically the first really good study looking to see exactly what do steroids do uh, with an MS attack. And what it showed is that at the end of the 30-day period, where you can see with that vertical line that um, those people in the study who had received steroids, it seemed like their visual function was better uh, than those people had not gotten steroids that had gotten the placebo. Uh, however, you waited. Um, later on for, oh, that's a typo, it should say 180 days instead of 120, but basically six months later on, when those people had gotten the placebo, it seemed that their recovery had improved almost to the point uh, as the same as those who had gotten the steroids. So what this taught us is that steroids, uh, it seems to accelerate the rate of recovery, that you may start to improve faster. However, over time, uh, the rate, the degree of recovery was the same. It, it did not improve that um, and whatnot. So, um, sometimes if somebody's attack is mild, we may not necessarily give steroids if somebody's had allergic reaction to them or, or didn't like them to begin with. And we can at least know that if it's milder, then their degree of recovery it won't suffer if they don't receive steroids. 
Um, but these findings, we apply this to not just optic neuritis, but to other attacks of MS as well. Um, the other thing that was important from that optic neuritis treatment trial, as we call it, is that optic neuritis um, showed us um, what if somebody gets optic neuritis, what their chance of developing MS, full-blown MS, later on was. And that was because some of the people had uh, enhancing lesions not just at the optic nerve, but also in other parts of the brain. Uh, in this particular case, the person had a lesion in the left uh, lobe uh, where, the, where the right lower arrow is. And what the trial showed us is that those people who had just a lesion involved in the optic nerve, but no lesions in the rest of the brain, over the subsequent 10 to 12 years of follow-up, this was a very long-standing trial, over the subsequent 10 to 12 years of follow-up, about 22% of those people ended up getting another attack, a second attack um, that, that fulfilled criteria for multiple sclerosis. Um, however, if initially at the beginning a person had an MRI scan like that in the upper right, uh, where there is one additional lesion um, and not just the optic nerve had lesion, that actually their risk for developing MS went up to about over 50% over the subsequent 10 years. So this optic neuritis treatment trial gave us a lot of information about which people would be at higher risk for getting another attack, and, and, and actually it'll help us drive our decision making whether to recommend if somebody should be on a disease-modifying therapy or not. Uh, but this was the other outcome about the optic neuritis treatment trial. So something else that we know with the optic nerve is that um, as the optic nerve from the right-hand side of the image goes towards the eyeball, once it gets inside the eyeball, the nerve fibers will then split um, and they'll spread along the back of the eye and form part of the retina, which captures all of the images coming in uh, through the eye. And um, that layer of the nerve along the back of the retina, of the eyeball called the retina, that's what we call the retinal nerve fiber layer. And um, basically, the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer, it reflects the thickness of the optic nerve. If there's any damage to the optic nerve, it'll over time reflect this thinning of that retinal nerve fiber layer. And so we can actually assess the, op uh, the retinal nerve fiber layer uh, with a technique called optical coherence tomography, or OCT. Many of you have, may have undergone this test uh, during your MS visit or whatnot, and you see you sit there and the machine will scan your eye. Usually takes a very short period of time. We do both eyes and then we get the printout um, that the technician is looking at on the right-hand side. And basically what happens is that the machine, it, it sends a, a beam of light, um, infrared light, and it bounces off the back of your eye and then it does whole bunch of fancy things to break out um, um, the different uh, light layers. It's similar to ultrasound, um, where you get a different signal uh, reflecting off the tissue. Um, and basically, we can get an image. Um, the retinal nerve fiber layer is the red part that you can see indicated by the red arrow. And again, this um, red layer there, it can be thinner if there's damage uh, from optic neuritis. And so, this is an image of an OCT that was performed on somebody who had optic neuritis. The right eye was normal. The optic neuritis was on the left-hand side. And, um, and you can see that there's a lot of very blurring of the edges, indicating a lot of swelling and inflammation. And so what the OCT in this situation would show us is that the right eye, which is normal, um, the OCT um, picture on the right-hand side, basically the thickness of the optic nerve head is indicated by the black line. You can see it's mostly within the green arrow, the green area. The green area reflects what the normal thickness should be uh, at different um, segments of the optic nerve. And in, in general, the average is about 100 microns. Um, but with the left eye, you can see that the line is above the green area, and the average thickness is about 200 microns. And that's because the optic nerve head is swelling from all of the information. And um, you can see on the bottom, that the left uh, optic nerve, the retinal nerve fiber thickness, it's much higher than the right eye because of all of the swelling. So we'll see that with acute optic neuritis, again, usually after three uh, days. Um, so that's, again, what we see on the fundoscopy after three days. Um, about three to six months later on, however, um, what goes on is that the optic nerve actually tends to shrink um, because it was injured, and unfortunately, um, even though we try to preserve a lot of the tissue, some of it can be damaged beyond repair, 
by the inflammation. And because of that, then the nerve will shrink in size. And they've estimated, they found in studies that um, after a single attack of optic neuritis, the optic nerve will lose about 25% of its thickness. And then when we look at it with the fundoscope, again, three to six months later on, um, what we'll see is that the optic nerve looks pale. You can see the edges are sharp because the swelling has gone down, um, but it's paler in color, a lot whiter, not as red or pinkish, uh, again, because it's lost nerve fibers. And what we've seen is that even if you don't have optic neuritis, because MS can cause secondary progression, um, you can actually lose thickness of the optic nerves. This is an example of somebody who had MS for 40 years and the, and the optic nerves are a little more yellow than usual. And then when you look on the bottom of the picture, you see the numbers within the round circles. Those are the thickness of the optic nerves, uh, of the retinal nerve fiber layer, I should say. And usually it's about 100 microns, but in this case it's about 60. Um, so you can actually have visual dysfunction with MS even if you've never had optic neuritis just because the nerves are shrinking on their own. Um, the symptoms that you may notice with this, again, even if you haven't had optic neuritis, is that you may have troubles with low contrast vision. Um, this is an example where you have high contrast numbers at the top with black letters on a white background, but as you go down, you'll see you'll lose contrast because the letters will fade into the background. A lot of people normally are able to see down at the bottom on the left-hand side, there's an R and an S and a Z, and then maybe an H, and then you lose it. Uh, but if you have MS, you may only be able to make it down to halfway down. And the reason is, again, because the optic nerves um, have, been, have been shrinking a bit and degenerating over time. So in real life, if you have troubles with low contrast acuity, um, the daytime is okay, because obviously everything is bright. At night, if it's pitch black, a lot of times people can actually usually do okay because there's so much contrast. You can see that there's bright lights with a black background and maybe you'd be able to see that there's a person walking on the sidewalk uh, on the left and whatnot. But you can still actually kind of make things out. The time when people have the most trouble uh, is at dusk, twilight, either early morning or in the evening and that half hour as the sun's going down because there's very little contrast and people have a lot of more trouble with this, like when they're driving home or things like that. Um, so that's just something to be aware of, that sometimes maybe it's better to wait a little bit or you, or you leave earlier. Um, certainly a lot of people have told me that as time goes on, they have trolls with glare, with like oncoming headlights, there's like a halo around it or just super, super bright. And I know some people have resorted to having to wear sunglasses during that time. And, and the, again, this is the reason why, because the optic nerves are shrinking, then you lose the reserve, you lose the power to withstand the brightness um, of, of oncoming headlights. There is a phenomenon called Uthoff's phenomenon, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about or maybe even experienced, and that's where we call it a pseudo-relapse, where you've had, for example, optic neuritis, um, and then you cover your vision, uh, but then after that, whenever you become overheated, either through hot weather, exercise, or in the hot tub, then you lose vision and it gets blurred again. Um, and then um, when you cool down, um, then you can restore your vision again. Like for example, if you go into air conditioning after 30 minutes, then you come back again. And that's not a true attack. It's not a relapse, but a pseudo relapse. But basically because you've lost your reserve capacity with the optic nerves, then you can't withstand the stresses and your optic nerve decompensates. And this again is not just with vision, but it could be with weakness or numbness uh, or whatnot. Um, and it can apply to a number of different things. So. The last point is that certainly there's a lot of things that people try to do to withstand the Uthoffs. Either avoid the heat, or if you have to go out in the heat, and then you wear a cooling vest, or you have a cold drink on you, or that type of thing. Uh, there is a medication um, called 4-aminopyridine. It's in the active ingredient in this other medication um, called dalfampridine is a generic name, and Empire is the, is the trade name. Uh, but basically what this compound does is it transiently improves nerve function. It helps retain potassium in the nerve and it works better. Um, and dalfampridine is FDA approved for improving walking speed in people with MS. Um, but sometimes people reported that it can improve their vision transiently as well because the dalfampridine doesn't work on just the nerves going to the legs, but also other nerves, um, even to the eye. Uh, and whatnot. So that's a little side note about something that can be helpful. And that's, I think, about all we had. Um, so um, now we'll go to the questions and whatnot. Thank you, though, in advance for your attention. And hopefully this has been helpful. So I'll start reading off the questions about it. Um, so there's one question. If I have eye problems, should I see my MS doctor first 
or go to an eye doctor? And that's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, with the time that we had, I couldn't go through all of the different eye problems that are possible. Some people have double vision, which doesn't have anything to do with the optic nerves, but it could be um, because the, uh, the, the nerves of supplying the ocular muscles are impaired, um, or you can have eye pain, um, or you can have loss of acuity over time. I think it's reasonable to go to the eye doctor if it's a chronic problem that's been slowly going on. If you know that you have glaucoma, or if you think your eyeglasses need to be adjusted, that's one thing. I think certainly if you have abrupt changes in vision, certainly reasonable to call the MS doctor to make sure it's not an attack of optic neuritis or something else. Unfortunately, there's a lot of different things that can occur uh, with it, um, um, and like different things that can affect the eye, including infections or whatnot. Um, but I would say that's in very general terms. If it's acute change, then I would call the MS doctor. If it's been more slower ongoing, they can try the eye doctor. If the MS doctor evaluates you and doesn't feel it's the MS, then they can refer to the eye doctor um, and see. If, and I think that's how I'd go about it. As someone who had optic neuritis 20 years ago, resolving without steroids, how common is a recurrence as one ages? You know, in very, very general terms, it seems that people with MS, as time goes on, their risk for relapse really goes down, especially after about five years or so. Um, and so that's a very general cutoff. Obviously, there are exceptions, but it's been over five years. Certainly from 20 years, I would expect the risk of relapse to be very, very small. However, again, as, as we've seen that you can have secondary progression that can be very, very sneaky, um, that can occur where the optic nerves can shrink on their own, sometimes even 10 or 25%. And when that happens, you may be more prone to the Uthoff phenomenon, where you may just have trouble seeing uh, when you get overheated, or it may be just because that your optic nerves have shrunk. You may just notice more trouble seeing it at low contrast environments like dark, or have troubles tolerating um, bright lights coming on. You may have more troubles getting up at night to go to the bathroom, you just can't see as well, and you're wondering what's going on. It could be that, not that it's a recurrence of optic neuritis, but it may be that just the, the nerve heads, uh, they shrank and degenerated slowly over time, part of a secondary progressive phase. If you've had an episode of optic neuritis with a large lesion touching the optic chiasm and the eyesight has come back, is it likely to happen again? I think certainly um, there's a couple things. Again, the same thing applies. I think that as time goes on, if it's been over five years, more like 10 years or 20 years that it's occurred, I think the chance of relapse is low. Uh, certainly, if you've had a lesion touching the optic chiasm, one of the possibilities that we think about is that it may not be necessarily MS, but it could be um, this other condition called Devic's disease or neuromyelitis optica, which has a higher chance of hitting that part. And if that's the case, then actually, as if you have Devic's disease, as time goes on, then your risk for relapse goes higher. It would be the opposite. Certainly, we check for Devic's for, on virtually everybody with an MS attack with a blood test um, to see if they have this antibody called the aquaporin-4 antibody. And so usually it's something that's discovered rather quickly. Um, if you've been okay for over five years, then I think your chance of recurrence is low. But again, as I said with the other question, as time goes on, you may notice more trolls with vision just because of the secondary generation where the optic nerves are shrinking and you have trolls with seeing at night, seeing at dusk, uh, trolls with bright glare, and things like that. If not, then actually maybe Dr. Smith, now you could maybe address what you think about these other questions. Tysabri has been recommended to me after Copaxone. I'm worried about trying it. How do I get more confident about it, feeling worried about the JC virus? Sure. So thanks, Dr. Wu, uh, for that presentation. Um, yeah, for this question, you know, one thing uh, I think to keep in mind when it comes to the concern about, about infection risks with a lot of the MS therapies is that there are very legitimate and important concerns, but a key point is that we have ways to de-risk these therapies. So for instance, with Tysabri or natalizumab, um, we have a program in place where the JC virus antibody titer, which is an amount of the antibody floating in your blood, is checked on a regular basis. Um, kind of echoing what Dr. Eubank had said earlier. We really see that when you check the JC virus antibody on a regular basis and you combine it with other information about a particular person, like how long they've been on Tysabri, like if they've had prior exposure to other immunosuppressive therapies, you can really, really de-risk the chances of getting into trouble. And so we have these programs in place in order to make these therapies safe. 
hopefully that can help give you some more confidence. Um, it's more than just saying that Tysabri causes this. You know, we have we have a way to de-risk that that problem. Um, and then the other question, I think, just a little bit, someone had asked just for a little bit of information about the COVID vaccine in relationship to MS. Um, in summary, it's vaccines that are live that make us nervous in our MS patients because the, the virus itself is live. And when someone's immune system is suppressed due to a treatment, there might be a chance of an infection happening or something bad happening. The good thing is that in general, as more vaccines for infections in general are made, there's less of a tendency to de develop these live vaccines. And so in particular with the COVID vaccines, a, a few of the first two that came out are mRNA based. This means these are not live vaccines. We really feel that they are safe to get um, in our MS patients even on, um, you know, on their MS medications. Um, and so we do recommend that. All right. So I think I am going to close out our session here with a talk on MS and the microbiome. Here's what I would like to talk to you about today. First of all, I would like to go through what the microbiome is, what it means, and uh, what's in it. We're also going to discuss something which is called the gut-brain axis. I'll explain what that means and how it relates to MS. And we're also going to talk about potential ways in the future that we may be able to do things to modify or change our microbiome. But before we get into this, what I'd like you to do is actually just to close your eyes and imagine yourself 15, 20 years from now going into a visit with your primary care physician who you've just met. You've had a history taken, you've had a physical exam done, and somewhat surprisingly, you are asked to give a stool sample. This stool sample is analyzed for all the different bacteria within it, and all the genetic material within that stool is amplified hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, and it's analyzed, and what you get out of all this is a printout of your microbiome. What types of bacteria live inside your gut? With that information, your doctor can actually help you make changes, including taking medications, which we'll talk about, uh, such as prebiotics and probiotics. We'll discuss the difference between those two things. Dietary changes, maybe even a fecal transplant, in order to change things about your health things that have long-term impacts on potentially what surgeries you could or could not receive, what lifestyle, what dietary changes you should make, and even an idea about what medications might work well for you or not as well for you. We're a long way off from that, but the ball is rolling. And so what I'd like to start with is how old is the microbiome? So for 3.5 billion years, single-celled bacteria had the world to themselves. But... About 500 million years ago, we started to see emergence of small organisms that were multicellular. And they found that there was actually a pretty beneficial relationship with the single cell bacteria. The bacteria went into the gut of the organisms. Um, the bacteria was sheltered. It was kept safe. And the organism was benefited as well. The bacteria was able to help with digestion and help with nutrient processing and even let off chemicals um, that were beneficial for the immune system and for, and for other things. And so this concept has gone on and on. And then us humans come onto the scene one million years ago. And sure enough, our guts are colonized by bacteria. And it's not unique to humans. It is the theme of all life uh, that really all organisms have the same relationship with bacteria. This is my favorite slide of the talk, actually, um, just because it is amazing to think about how vast the microbiome really is. So when we refer to the microbiota, we are actually talking about the, all of these organisms inside our body. There are more cells from microbes on and in our body than there are cells of our own. And if you were to take all of the bacteria within your intestine and held it in your hand, it'd be about four and a half pounds, which is really unbelievable. When you look at the genetic material of the microbiota, that is the technical word microbiome. So microbiome is really referring to the genetic material of these 
of these bacteria. And 99% of the genetic material in and on our body is amazingly microbial rather than our own. So this is a complicated picture illustrating the tree of life. And so what do I mean by the tree of life? When we think about living organisms, we always divide them up into how they are similar or how they are different. If you look at this thing on the left, this is the standard way that we classify life. We talk about life in general. We talk about domains, kingdoms, phylum, class, order, family, so on and so forth. Let's go back. Three big kingdoms. I don't know if you can see it on the slide, but there, uh, there's, a king, there's a kingdom of bacteria. There's a kingdom of archaea. And then down in the bottom right, we have the eukaryotes. So just to illustrate how complicated this is, um, you know, we used to say there's lots of bacteria, but now there have been ways to sequence all the genetics of these bacteria, and what you find out is that there are probably more and more differences than we ever imagined. Think of every animal that you've ever seen or heard of. If you wrote that into a list, you would probably have multiple, multiple pages of, of animals. Look in the bottom right corner, that tiny, farther, most out um, kind of green arm of this diagram, that right there represents all living animals and fungi. Everything else that you see on there uh, is every other facet of life. And look up top at the, in the bacterial kingdom. So the, the complexity of this is just, is just amazing. And so I'm going to spend about 20 minutes going through each of these individual, I'm just kidding. So we're not going to do that. But I do want to give you a brief overview. When some people ask, well, what's in the microbiome? You can, you know, here on the left is our classification system. And so we look at these things called the phyla. So there's probably six major phyla that you can see listed there that are the most relevant ones that are, that are in our intestines. And I'm not going to go through them all by name, but just to kind of put them into real life examples. So the firmichutes in the very top, these are things that, that you may have heard of. Uh, things like C. difficile, things like uh, botulism, things like tetanus. Uh, go down to the third one there, the actinobacteria. So these are actually very important in our intestine, but they're also important in nature, specifically in the soil. And so this is important for agriculture. Um, the proteobacteria, the fifth one down, this is, uh, you may have heard of salmonella. This is a type of food poisoning. So another kind of real life example that we've all heard of. The last one there, so these are within us, but then they're also examples of some types of organisms that can withstand really, really rugged environments, high, high temperatures, high salt concentrations, acidic environments, kind of at the extremes um, you know, of, of life on Earth. So when it comes to our intestine, there's regional specialization. It means that there's different bacteria in different places. So on the right, we've got a picture of the human intestine, the small intestine, the, the stomach leading to the small intestines in the middle, and then we're going to go through the large intestine here in a second. And so in the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine, we see a lot of lactobacilli. We see that they create certain types of compounds that I've listed here. The jejunum is the next segment, and we see that there's a predominance of lactobacilli and also something called streptococci. Uh, the point isn't so much the names, it's just the fact that there's this, it's interesting in that the makeup of what's in the gut changes throughout it. And it has to do with the actual function, it has to do with the actual structure of the gut, how thick the wall is, how close the cells are together, and it has to do with the environment uh, that it's in. So the different amount of, of acidity or the pH makes a big difference in terms of what is, what is living there. When you go to the large, so where the small and the large intestine meet, it's called the cecum. And the appendix you can see here on the bottom left, I've got it circled in red. This is the part actually that has the most diversity in terms of different types of microbial life in our intestine. Um, the colon is the large, you know, the end of our bowel. The colon is a very important part because this is the place where most we call short chain fatty acids are made. And we're going to talk about short chain fatty acids in a little bit more detail, but they seem to be very important. So how does our microbiome become colonized? How do we get bacteria in us? So the very first time that we come in contact with bacteria is as we are born. So depending upon if we are born vaginally uh, and we, we, we counter bacteria through the birth canal or if we're, if we're born as a C-section, we're going to have different types of exposures. 
um, it's really felt that the intestine of an infant is sterile and that there's probably not significant bacterial growth in the intestines. But if you look at a baby's meconium, the first stool passage, there's already bacteria found within it. Um, a, the diet, right from the get-go, makes a big difference. Is your, ba you know, as a baby, is are you breastfed? Are you formula fed? Are you combination fed? The different types of food that you have um, as you're developing, all these things are making a difference in terms of what you're coming in contact with. And I'm personally going through this right now as our ten-year-old or our ten-month-old daughter is trying uh, new solid foods, and so every time she tries something new, I'm always wondering what's this doing for the microbiome, and I'm hoping that avocado is not important because she definitely does not like that. Um, but interestingly, there's three years, we think, of really a big fluctuation in what's in your microbiome. But by the time a child is you know, past three, it's a pretty similar composition to what's found in an adult. So one question that researchers have is, is that an important time if we're going to target the microbiome? Is that the time potentially to do it or to, to think about it? One question that comes up is how much is this related to my genetics? Maybe some. It seems like genetics always is important to some extent. But when you look at studies, there, there are some that show, for instance, in monozygotic twins, maybe some particular fam family of bacteria are a little bit more common. But all in all, at the end of the day, this seems to be probably a lot environmentally driven. So this is a big, busy slide, but it's important to talk about. There's a thing called the gut-brain axis. In other words, we always think of all of these organs as uh, independent things, but they're very much communicated communicating with each other and related to each other. So when we look at our intestines or our gut, one thing to keep in mind is that there is a massive nervous system in our intestines. So we always think of the nervous system as the brain and, and the spinal cord. Um, however, there are millions and millions and millions of neurons and connections just within our gut itself. There are physical connections between the gut and the brain via nerves. One common classically thought of example, something called the, vag the vagus nerve, probably one of the biggest nerves in our body. This nerve is actually responsible in part for the brain telling the intestines it's time to digest food. Uh, so it starts what's called peristalsis and movement of muscles so that food's able to pass through our intestine. So there's communication there. And then at the same time, there's actually communication uh, between brain and gut through different chemicals and specifically hormones. Um, so. As an example, the brain can rele cause release of hormones into the bloodstream that go to the gut. The gut actually has in it receptors for these hor hormones. And interestingly, the gut can also make its own hormones. So if you have heard of serotonin, we talk about serotonin a lot because it's a common chemical in the brain, which it is, but probably 90% of the serotonin in our body is actually in our uh, digestive system. So as you can see, there's very much a communication here. And the immune system lies right in the middle of it, as you can see on that picture. Um, we see that the immune system is directly impacted by uh, this two-way communication. And if the immune system is revved up or revved down, it can also have an impact on, on both organs. Um, another thing that I'll mention here is uh, if you look on the left, on the bottom, it says dietary factors, so things that we eat are processed by our microbiome into different metabolites. Uh, and some of these metabolites are, are hormones, but other ones are other chemicals that seem to have impact on the, on the immune system, among other things. And short-chain fatty acids is an example of this. We're going to talk about it more in a minute. The picture on the right is honestly showing essentially the same, the same thing here. Just again, highlighting the um, complexity, I think, probably most importantly, but the communication between brain and gut. We have in our gut an immune system as well. We have something called the gut-associated lymphatic tissue, or GALT. Basically, the blue is the inside of the tube, this is the inside of the lumen uh, where food is passed, and underneath it is the blood vessels and everything else. And things that are processed in the lumen are broken down and recognized by the immune system underneath the surface. And they pass through this lymphatic channel you can see on the bottom to these lymph nodes. And aside from that, there are little things called Peyer's patches. You can see an example of one kind of on the right. These are areas in the, immune, or in the uh, intestinal tract where there are tons of immune system cells basically just waiting to receive information from what is inside the gut lumen. So one question that always comes up is, 
we are interested in the microbiome, how are we going to understand uh, how to change it? Uh, how can it be studied specifically when it comes to, say, neurological disorders? One way of doing this is that you could take a group of people who do not have a particular problem or illness or disease, which are the blue one that says control group, and then you take a group of people who do have the thing that you're interested in, say MS, and you actually look at the stool between the two groups of people to see at the level of these organisms how it differs from one another. That's one way of doing it, and it has, there are studies that have looked at, have looked at this question and uh, will continue to do so. Another way of studying it is to actually take a group of people who have, say, MS, to take stool from them and to see in mice what happens. These are typically mice that are um, that have been altered in such a way that they are what we call susceptible to the disease. In other words, could, is it possible to transfer, so to speak? Is there something about the microbiome in that stool that would, uh, in a susceptible mouse, cause cause the, the MS or whatever the disease is that we're talking about? That is also, has also been looked at and is and will continue to be. Um, other you know other ways uh, that this can be looked at. Here's the here's one question that you know, is still in its infancy, but could you take a group of people who do not have the problem, who are healthy, take their stool and then transplant it uh, into people who do have the problem to see if the microbiome will make a, uh, if the microbiome will make a difference in those people who, who have the disease. And then lastly, is there, are there things that we can do? Are there things that we can eat? Are there foods? Are there probiotics? Are there prebiotics that we can take now to affect our microbiome? So that's going to lead us into this question, which is how do we modulate the microbiome? So is there an effect on, of diet on the microbiome? There most certainly is. So this is a study that is basically taking two groups of people. These are children, a group of children who are, who are mostly from Western Europe, and then there was a group of children from Africa. The diets were differing um, from one another. So in general, this was more of an agrarian diet. There was a lot of fruits and vegetables. There was a lack of uh, processed foods. There was a lack, generally speaking, of a lot of meat. And we see that there's, in general, a greater proportion of these shorter chain fatty acids, which we feel are important in that sort of a diet. And it also coincided with a different uh, makeup of the microbiome in these children. And so one question is, we keep talking about the microbiome as if it is all about the bacteria. Which bacteria do you have? Which are good? Which are bad? But is there more to it than that? Is it really what we call the metabolome? In other words, is it the stuff that the bacteria make that makes a difference? So these short-chain fatty acids are, are shown here on the bottom. Uh, these are, you know, we, we, we see produced as bacteria uh, digest things like uh, fibers, fruits, and vegetables, and the, the uh, bacteria ferment them into these short-chain fatty acids. And so in other words, another question, you know, looking forward to the future is not just maybe modifying the bacteria you have, but at the end of product is how to, you know, the products that are produced by the bacteria. Maybe that's the most important question to be asking. Um, this is probably one of the most interesting things I came across when I was preparing for this talk. Um, so this is true. So there are studies in Japanese populations that have shown that following consumption of seaweeds, there are genes that encode enzymes that are metabolizing marine red algae, shown below. These genes are actually transferred from marine-associated bacteria to specific bacteria in the intestines of people who are eating this, which I think is fascinating. And it goes back to our favorite scientist, Jeff Goldblum from Jurassic Park, who was right in that he said, life does find a way. Um, we see that sleep has an impact on our microbiome. We see that exercise has an impact. Um, we see that exposures, just even uh, things that we're around on an everyday basis, may have some impact. Here's a random but interesting study showing that couples who lived together and had a dog in the house, interestingly, had a very similar uh, composition to their microbiome, but when you substitute the dog for a child, that similarity goes away. Now, I'm not sure if it is good or if it is bad to have a similar microbiome, microbiome in this case, but it goes to the point that I think um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that, that can impact this. 
And so the big question that always comes up is what diet should I be eating to improve the health of my microbiome? Um, and to be honest, there is not enough solid evidence that really you can say there's any specific diet that you must or should definitely do. I think if you want big picture uh, truths, we, said, we see that in general, uh, the more, and some of this may be not surprising, but the more well-rounded a diet is, the more incorporation of vegetables, of uh, fruits, the more likely we see these short-chain fatty acids and the, probably the, the bigger the benefit on lots of neurochemicals and immune system chemicals. Does that mean that we should never have Western diet food? I do not think it means that. That would be an extreme view. But I think that in general, it is probably true that we see that more processed foods and more you know, meat-based things in general have some less of this, um, this characteristic to them. Um, Pro versus prebiotics. So what is the difference between a probiotic and a prebiotic? Um, so a probiotic is eating something so that your intest so that the bacteria within your intestine change. Uh, so it's eating sauerkraut, say in you know non-fermented foods um, that you can that you can ingest and the idea is that you're sort of kind of like picking up, so to speak, the bacteria from that food. Versus a prebiotic, so a prebiotic is it's food, it's food for you, but it's also food for the bacteria in you. And so, in other words, could you eat certain things such that the um, so that you are changing the nutrients available to your microbiome so that it, the composition of it changes? Studies have been done and are ongoing, and most are small at this point looking at questions of this. No, there is no data, firm data, on any particular pro or prebiotic at this point that we would say there's clear enough stuff to recommend it. But it is a very much an interesting question that I think deserves a lot more research. Um, fecal transplantation. So this is interesting. And so fecal transplantation is a real thing. And in fact, actually goes back to fourth century Chinese medical literature for severe food poisoning, believe it or not. And actually, 16th century Ming Dynasty medical textbook talk about a fermented fecal mixture known as yellow soup, which was used for remedies and at times to induce vomiting, which may not be surprising. Um, but fecal transplantation has been used uh, here. I mean, we use it here in the United States. The most common example is in C. diff. So C. diff colitis is when our normal bacterial flora is overpopulated. There's too much C. diff. And when, when folks are having, um, you know, when folks are not responding to typical treatments with the antibiotics that we use, uh, fecal transplantation can be helpful into restoring the normal flora. And so that's something that, that is done. Uh, typically, when it comes to a fecal transplant, it's usually done through a colonoscope or an enema, maybe even a, an infusion through the, th uh, through the intestinal wall or even as an oral capsule. Yes, there are studies ongoing in MS to look at the question of fecal transplantation. I will say that they are very small. They, they tend to be five, to, there's several examples, um, you know, five to 10 people. These are not large scale studies by any means. And most of the things that they're looking at are, are questions like, if this occurs, how does the chemical makeup of someone's blood change? You know, is there a more immune system or less immune system and questions like this. There'll be much more to come with this as well. So I think I'm kind of coming to the conclusion here. Um, I think that the thing I wanted to highlight are a few themes. So one theme is that this is a really interesting field. It's, a, it's truly an intersection of so many different disciplines. We see microbiology, gastroenterology, immunology, endocrinology, neurology all coming together when it comes to this topic. And there's truly five-way communication. Things that the microbes in our intestines do impact the endocrine system, uh, impact the immune system, and ultimately impact our brain, and, and, and uh, so on and so forth. As you can tell, this because this is so complex, it's very hard to study. So here are some limitations in the field. So right now, a lot of the research that's being done is being done in animals, in mice. Um, the other thing is that when it comes to the human studies as of now, as I was kind of mentioning with some of these other things, the pro and the prebiotics and stuff, um, small numbers, really, really small numbers of people. Also, as we've talked about, microbiome is really easily affected by so many different variables, our food, our diet, the medications that we take, antibiotics that we may have taken. And so it's very, very hard to control factors when it comes to these experiments and these studies. 
But what's, what's going to come in the future? You know, we hope, so one thing is that it used to be very expensive and costly to look at genetic material. If you're going to look at, say, a, um, look at a stool sample to see what, what the genetic material is there so that you can understand the, the um, bacteria that are there, this would take, you know, days and days and weeks and weeks. But as we get better and better at it, it's getting more efficient and it's getting cheaper. And so the ability to, to do these sorts of studies is more promising. Um, it seems that uh, there may be certain time points in our life where the microbiome perhaps is more important than others. Like as I was mentioning in that first three years when we're, when, you know, as a baby and as we're developing. Is that a, a time point when we might be able to intervene more than others? We don't know. Um, this is potentially an area of medicine that can become personalized. We talk about personal, you know, personalized medicine. Oncology has done this to an extent in a lot of ways. You know, we learn the genetic, you know, we know more than just that someone has cancer. We understand the genetic underpinnings behind it so we can tailor their treatment more to them. And so this is another example of how we may be able to do this, um, you know, for, for other conditions, including MS. Um, how can we modify the microbiome is the big question. We know that there is a relationship and an impact of diet, of antibiotics, of probiotics, of prebiotics, all these various things. The question is, you know, what's the right way to do it? And um, this may be person, person dependent. It may not be, you know, a one size fit all answer. Which bacteria to target? Uh, do we target certain bacteria? Is it that we want to eliminate one certain type or is a, you know, or is it, it we don't, we don't know. And the other thing is, if you target bacteria, let's say that you give them an antibiotic to, to get rid of them, the effects that you create, is that a permanent change or is that a short-lived change? Because we see that a lot of times after, of course, antibiotics, there is a change in the flora of your intestine, but it's not necessarily a permanent change. And within a few weeks, you may be back to how, how you were before. So in summary, um, it's a really cool topic. I think there's a lot. There's not. I, I certainly don't have any firm things to tell you as in, get this probiotic or this prebiotic. Or, but as you can see, I think the point of the talk is to kind of give you an idea of what's up and coming and I think to appreciate um, the complexity of all this. Um, so thank you for your time and for, um, for joining us. I have a few questions here that I was going to answer. One, um, one question is how is the immune system, uh, how is the immune system impacted uh, with MS? And so how was the immune system impacted with MS? Um, so this is a good question. I think this is another complicated question. Um, in general, when it comes to MS, we see that there is a revving up, or so to speak, of the immune system and our autoimmunity. In other words, the immune system is attacking uh, our own body by mistake. Uh, in particular for MS, we see the impact on our, you know, our brain and spinal cord and eyes. And so the, the reason for why someone's immune system is doing that is complicated. Um, and in, in two, it may not also be a one-size-fits-all answer. You know, we, we still don't fully understand why MS occurs, uh, what triggers it, and in individuals that may not be the same answer for, you know, for two people. Um, we, we have an, an idea of what sorts of things are risk factors for de developing this problem, but we don't fully understand the cause. Um, Another question is, um, could one person's body handle these foods better than others? Like in other words, um, could, uh, yeah, is making a, a dietary recommendation a one-size-fits-all thing? I think you're right in bringing this question up. Um, yes, I think that the, the answer is not going to be a one-size-fits-all. We see that, you know, there are dietary intolerances, and as an example, uh, of various foods, um, as an example, celiac disease, um, you know, an intolerance or essentially an allergic reaction to, to gluten uh, is one example where uh, that most of you know, have heard of or are familiar with where it's not, it's not going to be um, a, a, uni a, a, a single answer. I think that my, uh, my opinion is that there's going to be, if we can get to the point when we can do this, it's, it's going to have to do with a lot of our prior exposures, um, what medicines we're currently taking, perhaps how old we are, perhaps our other comorbidities, perhaps where we live. I don't know. There's a lot of unknowns, I think, with that. But I think it is fair to say it's unlikely that there's going to be five years from now a unified, this is the MS diet. Um, 
for everyone, per se. But I think, in general, the idea of a well-balanced diet, lots of fruits and vegetables, which, I, again, I know is not surprising to hear. However, there is some, I think, scientific merit that, that, that in general, that type of a pattern has some benefits. And how long, the other question is, how long do you think it will be before we're testing patients uh, for microbiome? Yeah, I mean, so it's happening now. It's happening now in the sense that not, not as everyday practice, but in clinical trials, um, this is part of, you know, part of the process where people are having, having this uh, looked at and then they're getting an intervention of some type, a medication, a probiotic, a dietary change, and then it's, it's looked at again um, to see what impact has, has taken place. So to some extent, we're testing now, um, but I think we're still in, in the learning phase. But there will be more to come. And so with that, um, I appreciate your time, and uh, I really appreciate everyone. We all appreciate everybody's afternoon um, and spending it with us. Um, this will conclude our event um, for this year. We certainly hope to be able to see you all in person next year. Um, this recording will be available for anyone who missed it. And the other thing to let you know is that if you have any ideas for future topics that you are interested in hearing about, uh, say at the next year event, please email us to let us know. And the email address for this is neurowellness, all one word, at ohiohealth.com. Again, neurowellness at ohiohealth.com. Please let us know if there's any topics of interest to you that you would like to hear about at next year's event. So we hope that you have a good Friday and a good weekend, and thanks again.